Welcome back. This is uh, the next stage of the restoration of the Bush VHF 64. And uh, if you've been following the series, you may notice there's a slight difference to the look of this thing. Namely, the cleaning of the front plate, face plate and all the knobs. And they sure come out very, very nicely. The brass is shining through. The cream white is white again. Those guys are in perfect condition. Um, I had made an observation before that the quality of these piano keys is a little bit uh, lower than what I'm used to with the German sets, but they do the job anyway and they clean up nicely. The other knob, the volume knob, has got that middle brass um, disc missing, the wedge. I'm still thinking of how I'm going to replace that if I can. Faceplate itself is in perfect condition, cleaned up perfectly. So yeah, also a clean up on there in the back, as you can see. I've replaced uh, some of those wires that were cracked over there. If you remember on the Magic Eye, there was some of that dry rubber those have been replaced, trying to maintain the same colors. This wire is going to last forever, so that's a good step. And let's look at the underside and see what we've got. Another thing that may be noticeable here is that the magic eye is brighter. It's tuning perfectly. And it's a lot brighter than it was. And uh, what I did was I changed the connection of the B plus to this magic eye to a higher B plus voltage. And I'll show you inside what I've done. And what that does is um, it gives it a little bit more life. Now, you can't exceed 250 volts. You shouldn't exceed 250 volts. But this particular one is connected to that uh, third B plus the one that comes off the 20 microfarad capacitor, which is at about 200 volts. And I removed it from there and connected it to the second B+, plus, which is at 245, 250 volts. And that's the result. Everything else stays the same, except you're giving it a little bit more oomph. And because this is aged somewhat, you get a brighter result. And since we're talking about B pluses, this point here, there are three connectors, red, a yellow, and a blue. These are the three connection, connections to that uh, multi-can or multi-section can filter cap. So this really is your B+, plus, B+, plus 1, B+, plus 2, if you want to call it that. So you've got the highest voltage there, second highest there, third highest there. These two are two of the dropping resistors between them, and that's why they're pretty hefty. They, you can see they're pretty beefy. Now, what we're supposed to have on B plus one, which is uh, straight out of the, um, the rectifier and to the first filter can is 300 volts. Let's see what we have here. How's that? That is with the light dimmer bypass. So we've got no current limit. That is a coincidence. I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I mean, this could go up three, four, five volts easily or down but it's exactly 300 volts. The second B plus is supposed to be 245 according to the schematic. And that's the second B plus over there, 245 on the dot. Again, this is more luck than talent. This just happened, okay? This wire that you see here is the B plus for the Magic Eye tube, which used to be connected down here. Now this is the third B plus, which is supposed to be on FM, 180 volts. It's at 186. So, fair enough. Not bad. Now, this was connected to the bottom one here. It's now connected to the 245. It's well within the 250. Uh, in fact, this, uh, this tube can actually tolerate quite a bit more, but they recommend 250. So, we're at 245. Okay? That's why we're getting a bit more life out of the Magic Eye. The voltages, the B pluses are damn near spot on. The other thing that I've done is changed a wire in here. There's a connector here 
from the little circuit board down here, this red wire and this white wire that goes to the tone control, the bass control through here, two wires, okay? Now what they'd used is this. This is a, just a normal twin wire with no connection. This is a piece of cord, so there's no earth connection. This was completely unscreened. And just to make it worse, it was passing right by all the B pluses and all the AC voltages coming out of the transformer over here. So this could induce quite a bit of hum. So what I decided to do is replace it with a screen cable. This is a very good quality microphone cable, actually, with screen. And the screen is soldered to ground by soldering it to the body of this um, base control, this potentiometer. So we've got a screen signal going through there. This is a high impedance part of the circuit. It's uh, the audio signal itself. So you don't want to have, uh, you know, mains hum and everything else creeping into there. So this should make it a little bit more quiet. Also, you may be able to see down here that 6.8K resistor. That's the anti-hum uh, circuit in here that goes to the cathode of the EL84. That's now got that new resistor in there, the new cap in there. So it looks like it's all ready to go. And since I was coming to the stage where we're talking about hum and the elimination of hum, if you have any, um, one lesson I've learned is that checking for hum on my test speaker, that one over there, is sometimes a little deceptive. That speaker doesn't have a great bass response and hum is in the lower bass range. So what I decided to do was to do the restoration of the speaker section of this cabinet so that I could actually test the sound with the built-in speakers. And I had a few nasty surprises. One of them, as I've mentioned before, is that the cable was cracking. So I replaced all the cable, as you can see. That's all replaced, okay? So that's ready to go. What um, The other thing that I had was I had a fair amount of rust on here. As you can see, that all came out nicely. So that was great. Same on the other side. We had quite a bit of rust on there. All the rust is gone. The second speaker was lacking in that problem, at least. There was no rust really on here. So that was just cleaned up. Um, what I found on this speaker as well is that there was a tear on this uh, flexible ridge around here. So that had to be repaired with some glue and you've got to use the type of glue that doesn't dry, it stay, well it dries, but it stays flexible. So I reinforced that section there. So that speaker is good to go. Now, the other thing that I was curious about was that this electrostatic tweeter, the way it was wired, it looked like it was wired in reverse. Now, I've done a hell of a lot of these and, and quite honestly, I haven't really looked at the question of polarity because um, they, they generally are in, in place wired up originally but what I did was I pulled it out I replaced the the uh, foam that was dead in there which is quite normal so put it back in and then wired it up the way I thought it was going to be and yes lo and behold the speaker is working the tweet is working and also the the polarity was in fact the wrong way around I believe it does have an effect Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to test because the effect of this tweeter is very subtle. It only affects high frequencies, it only works at high frequencies. And if you're trying to determine whether it's working or not, it works, you determine it quite easily if you've got some measuring equipment or if your speakers don't have good mid range. Now, what I've noticed about these speakers, they're slightly different, the cones are different. So I think, and I haven't measured this, but I think that their uh, frequency responses are slightly um, layered. So one of these goes lower into the frequency range and the other one is more uh, mids and part of the highs. So if you've got good mid to high response on these anyway, it's very difficult to really hear the difference when you bring in that speaker, that tweeter. But there's an easy way of uh, checking that and I'll show you now. So what we have here is we've got this thing working. 
and I'm using my test speaker for this. And as I mentioned before, I've wired the test speaker from there. These are the two test speaker connections. That's ground and that's a signal. And that goes to this jack over there, which allows me to just easily connect a test speaker onto that. Also, when we removed the speakers, I told you that the tweeter, the electrostatic tweeter, was connected between that one, which is ground, and that one over there. So the way to test this, I can't switch the radio on without uh, a speaker connected. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect a dummy load to the speaker terminal. Let me do this, switch this off. So I'll take that guy out. I've got a dummy load connected here. This is a 5.6 ohm resistor. It's connected to a similar plug. So we connect that in there. So what we should have when we play the, play the, the, the music now is nothing, all right? We shouldn't hear anything because there's no speaker. There's actually a dummy load in place of the speaker. However, if I take the connections, if I take the signals to the electrostatic tweeter, so here's the, these two, this red and black, this red and black are the connections to the electrostatic tweeter. So if I connect this to ground and that one to the electrostatic tweeter output, I've got to be careful because this thing uses high voltage. I should be able to hear the tweeter. Let me connect that up and I'll show you. So here we have it. We have the connection to ground and the yellow one is to the connector for the electrostatic tweeter. That goes across here and it's over there. And don't forget, there's about 250 volts on there. Now, if I turn the volume up, can you hear that? I'm actually just hearing the high frequencies coming from the electrostatic tweeter. Let's listen again. So what I've determined is that the tweet is working fine and uh, although subtle, it does contribute to the sound. And I've got to tell you, I've connected this up to the actual speakers and the quality of this thing is astounding. I made some uh, slightly derogative comments about the quality of the components, namely the Hunts capacitors and the, the fact that some of the resistors uh, move high a lot higher than the German sets, but I've got to tell you, this, this is a game changer. Um, when I hear the sound, which you will hear as soon as I put this together, when I hear the sound on those speakers, it's far better than most of the German radios I've restored. Now, it doesn't beat some of them. This one here, for example, is very hard to beat. The sound of this thing is one of the best I've ever heard on a tube radio. This is a Saba Freiburg um, Automatic, Freiburg 8. But compared to the Gretzes and uh, the Grundigs, this thing beats them. So all I can say is if they copied the Grundig, they did a good job. They improved it. Anyway, that's this section done so far. So all that's left now is the cabinet and I've started working on the cabinet. Um, I've uh, sanded it down, wet sanded it down. And as usual, when you look for problems, you find them. Some of the uh, veneer was coming off, so I had to glue that in place. And uh, it's been more than just a slight sanding. I'm going to put a new gold trim on there as well. So uh, let me get to that.